Okay, well, hello everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for another virtual CanGeo talk. My name is Alex. I'm the digital editor with Canadian Geographic magazine. And it's an absolute pleasure to be speaking with you live from my home in Ottawa once again, uh, which is, of course, located on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation. And with me tonight behind the scenes is our social media editor, Angelica. She'll be holding it down in the live chat and the Facebook comments. That's right, we are live on Facebook as well as YouTube tonight. So hello to everyone joining us from the CanGeo Facebook page. If you have questions for tonight's speaker, please leave them in the YouTube chat or the Facebook comments, and I'll make sure to ask them in the Q&A at the end of the presentation. A couple of quick announcements before I introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, we have a great deal for those of you watching tonight. If you're not already subscribed to Canadian Geographic Magazine, you can get 30% off a one-year subscription using the code STORM30. All you have to do is go to cangeo.ca slash subscribe and enter the promo code in the little box you'll see there. So the code is STORM30 and you'll get six amazing issues of CanGeo delivered to your mailbox or your inbox, whichever you prefer. Uh, over the course of the next year. So definitely take advantage of that special deal for our uh, audience of our virtual talks. And if you've been enjoying our virtual event series, I am sorry to say we'll be taking a little break in the month of July, but that's because we're working on some super exciting virtual programming with the Métis Nation Saskatchewan for Back to Batoche Days. That's an annual celebration of Métis history and culture, um, and we've partnered with them to make it virtual this year. So watch our website and social media for more details on that coming soon. And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, George Karunas. Many of you will know George as the host of the TV show, Angry Planet, and many more of you will recognize him from his not infrequent appearances on Storm Hunters on the Weather Network. Uh, George is of course a storm chaser and an expert on severe weather. He is an explorer in residence of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. And he's an incredibly accomplished adventurer who has traveled to more than 70 countries on all seven continents in pursuit of nature's most extreme phenomena. And he's going to tell us about some of his craziest adventures tonight. So take it away, George. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. And thank you, everyone who's tuning in at home, watching on Facebook and YouTube. I'm coming to you live from my home office here in Toronto because I'm not able to be out trotting the globe right now. I'm uh, chained at home as, as much as anyone else is. And for someone who spends most of their life traveling, it is uh, rather difficult. So we make up for it wherever we can. And today we're coming to you virtually. And as Alex mentioned, I am an explorer in residence with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. And uh, my specialty is documenting and showcasing extreme forces of nature and extreme places all over planet Earth. And what I've got for you tonight is a selection of some of the highlights of my career spanning over, over 20 years of basically catching mother nature when she is having her biggest temper tantrums. So let's begin, shall we? I've got a, uh, I just wanna share my screen. And perfect, here we go. Awesome, this is gonna work, love it. I love it when technology goes my way because quite often it does not, especially when I'm dealing with <laughs> dust and rain and snow and ice and volcanic gases and every other thing that mother nature throws at me quite frequently. So uh, as I mentioned before, we're gonna be going through some of the most extreme of the extreme. Um, as an explorer, sometimes we think that there's really not a whole lot left to find out there, right? I mean, all of the continents have been discovered. We're not finding new islands. We have satellites that are mapping every square millimeter of the surface of planet Earth, but there is still plenty left to explore. The deep oceans, there are still places where no humans have ever set foot in caves, in jungles, and of course, the vastness of space. And even outside of those things, there's still lots left to discover. Wherever there are questions, there's exploration that still needs to be done. And so my role is 
to showcase parts of the world that are undergoing these extreme periods of transition. So where the tornado is touching down, that moment in time will never happen again. And so I'm there to document it and show people what Mother Nature is capable of. And in recent years, I've been seeing lots of tremendous changes in the weather, of course, due to uh, climate change. Uh, we're into the uh, Anthropocene period now, so we're seeing lots of changes caused by humans. And I'm sort of like a, like a war reporter on the front lines of climate change. So I'm able to see these things around the world. From tornadoes to hurricanes, of course, as oceans get warmer, that warm seawater is going to provide us with more energy, more fuel for hurricanes. So forecasters are expecting hurricanes to actually get stronger as we move forward. So tragedies like Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy, could potentially become more the norm than they are now. These one in 10 year storms are now becoming one in two year storms. And I like to be right in the middle of it to, to capture all of that, uh, that bluster and fury. Of course, I never hope for people to get into these life-threatening situations, and I'm always available to help people. Uh, we always help whenever we come across anyone who needs assistance. But from storms to also volcanoes, um, the Earth is a very dynamic place. And parts of it are still being created, even to this day. Right now, there are volcanoes, about 50 of them at any given time, are erupting around planet Earth. And I love to get nice and close to those. And I'm going to showcase some more volcano stuff later in the presentation tonight. So hold tight. I've got some spectacular stuff to show you. But not just weather and geological uh, phenomena, extreme places as well, such as Antarctica. I've had the great pleasure and privilege to be able to go to Antarctica numerous times. and. Uh, Sitting there just surrounded by penguins is just a marvelous experience. And it's so rugged and so beautiful and for the most part so untouched that uh, you really get that sense of wilderness. And a little bit of an uh, insider tip for you. Penguins are cute. They're hilarious to watch. I could sit there and watch them for hours, but they stink. <laughs> they, smell as, they smell as bad, as cute as they look, if that sentence makes any sense whatsoever. Uh, so from cold places to very hot places, this was a dust storm in Timbuktu in Mali. Um, this is actually a spot where you get these tremendous winds coming off the Saharan desert, which can actually blow through Mali, out through uh, the, the Cape Verde Islands and can form the early stages of some of these Atlantic hurricanes. So that's, they have sort of, some of their humble beginnings in the Sahara Desert. And I went there to investigate the, the birthplace, the, the incubation spot for some of these hurricanes. Uh, to becoming the first person to ever dangle on ropes above the boiling lake in uh, the island of Dominica in the West Indies. This was a world's first. No one had ever done this before. Uh, this was for an episode of Angry Planet. Uh, we did this in the rainy season, which made things so much more difficult. But uh, being sort of steamed or poached dangling 60 feet above a lake of boiling water it was certainly a memory that I will not forget anytime soon. To uh, an expedition I did in Madagascar where we were going through this place called the Singi de Bemaraha, which roughly translates to the place where you cannot walk barefoot. And it's Did you a very interrupt, but I think the audience is not seeing your slide there. This particular slide or all the slides? I think all the slides. We're seeing your title slide. Well, that's interesting because it is sharing. Let me try this again from this slide. If I go from here, are you able to see the cave? I do see a cave. I think you want to be in slideshow view rather than presenter view. It. Sorry, folks, we're just going to troubleshoot this live slide here. <laughs> I'm not in presenter view. Are you okay. able to see the photos there? Yep, I see your whole PowerPoint um, framework, though, including the, the next few slides. OK, well, I don't know why that's doing that. But what I'll do instead, then, is I will just do this. And if I'm not sure what the deal is with the, with the window, I'm, um, Let's go to 
It wasn't in presenter view, but try hitting play slideshow there. Your your green uh, play button. Are you able to see that? Yep, didn't really do anything. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not sure what the deal is with PowerPoint here, but but you can see that, right? And if I change slides here, you're able to see. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll go with that because we improvise as we go. That's what explorers do. Exactly. And, uh, you're in. You're uh, all along on this ride with me tonight. So, so these are the slides that you missed out on for the past couple of moments. I apologize for that technical glitch there, but uh, we're gonna persevere because that's what we do as explorers. So, anyway, there's the boiling lake dangling over top of that, and here is the cave in Madagascar. We were mapping some brand new uh, cave systems where no human had ever set foot before. So we were the first people to go to these uh, these caves. So that's a really wonderful thing to stand in a place where you know that no human has ever been. Uh, to Siberia, the, the coldest part of Siberia in the middle of winter where minus 40 is, is, a, is, a, is a warm spell. We actually had, had a bit of a warm spell there. It was only minus 40. I was expecting minus 55 or minus 60. And uh, I spent a bunch of time with the reindeer herders there and also with the permafrost experts who were studying how melting permafrost is affecting climate change and how climate change is affecting melting permafrost. Fascinating stuff. And from there to Australia, we know Australia recently had these terrible wildfires. A number of years ago, I was actually embedded with uh, a firefighting team outside of Adelaide, Australia, and they had their worst forest fire in 35 years. So um, I had to train to go in and, and uh, be with these people and uh, just to see how violently these eucalyptus trees burn. It's, it's really remarkable. They're full of these oils, those eucalyptus oils that, that we prize so much for their smell and, and such, but uh, they're very flammable. So they're, their nickname is the gasoline trees. So they burn like absolute mad. To places like North Korea, there I am with the RCGS flag. This is Mount Kumgang in North Korea. I was climbing some mountains there about two years ago. Uh, and right before this picture was taken, I'll share a little story with you. I had a bit of a medical issue where I developed a hernia and part of my small intestine started to poke out through a gap in the muscles in my abdomen wall. And I was literally on the side of a mountain in North Korea. So <laughs> what do you do? Well, you stuff your, your hand down your trousers, you push your intestines back in and you press on. And then when you finally get back home two weeks later, you, uh, you go see a surgeon and get it repaired. So, that's the, the hidden story behind that particular photograph. Don't try this at home. And for me, it's all about really curiosity. People think I'm brave or, or crazy. I don't, I don't think I am. I, I like to think that I'm more curious than anything else. And I really find that curiosity is the opposite of fear, right? So if you're curious about something, we're all born with such incredible curiosity. Anyone who has a toddler will tell you that. They, they know that for sure, uh, sometimes to a fault. So curiosity will draw you towards something, whereas fear will repel you away from it, like opposite poles on a magnet. And curiosity has served me very well uh, for my entire life. And I use that as the driving force for what I do. And then one of my favorite things is to go into classrooms and share what I've seen with students to get them interested and to spark their curiosity, to get them enthusiastic about the natural world, our place in it, get them interested in science and, uh, and nature, right? So I do that by showing them really cool images and uh, telling wild stories. Now, curiosity <laughs> sometimes can get you into trouble. I was, I was a, bit of, uh, a little bit of trouble when I was a kid, I'm sure, but uh, my influences back then were people like Jacques Cousteau, who was one of the leading ocean explorers of his time. No one can really top Jacques Cousteau, and of course, Indiana Jones for that spirit of adventure. Uh, living in Toronto, I really got my start in documenting weather while I was working as an engineer. That was my training and background. I used to build recording studios for a living, but I would take my, my time off and I would do things like photograph the CN Tower getting struck by lightning. It's basically the world's tall, fr tallest freestanding lightning rod, and it gets struck between 
70 to 100 times every single year. So it's a perfect uh, subject for, for me to get into photography back in the beginning in, in, the, in the 90s. And then from there, I just kept expanding, doing a little more and a little more until eventually now I, I'm up to having visited over 75 countries now and uh, with no sign of, well, <laughs> I was going to say with no sign of letting up, but this year has certainly put it on the brakes. I was supposed to have just gotten back from Iceland, but uh, that didn't happen. Uh, a lot of what I do is television based. Uh, Angry Planet was the show that really put me on the map for uh, being a, a communicator of science in the natural world, but there's been literally dozens and dozens of other programs on every network and streaming service that you can think of that, that I have had some involvement in over the years. So I'm sure that uh, you've probably been flipping channels and you may have seen me at some point out there. And tornadoes were really my first love. And I did my very first tornado chase back in 1998 and uh, was able to document uh, a tornado that crossed the road right where our van had been parked. We had to sort of take evasive maneuvers to get out of the path of this oncoming tornado and uh, captured the whole thing on video. This was back in the early tape camcorder days. So the quality was terrible, but that didn't matter. It was such a, a rush for me to be able to document that thing. And uh, it served as a spark that has lasted to this day. And the thing about tornadoes for me is that even though there are these rotating columns of air and cloud and water vapor, uh, the storms that create them are just as beautiful. They can be twice the height of Mount Everest, these massive rotating storms that uh, can concentrate all their energy on this one spot, hopefully just grinding up a farmer's field. And everyone is different. They, they take on different shapes and they almost have different personalities. Some of them are sort of elephant trunk shaped and others are these giant ugly wedge shapes. So it's always interesting because for me, I've seen well over a hundred of these, but every single one is a little different and they each have their own character. And uh, I like to remember them as individuals, even though they are nothing more than the earth trying to recalibrate and equalize its air pressure. But they can be quite beautiful and destructive, of course. Canada is the number two country in terms of tornadoes. The United States is number one by far. They get between, yeah, between 800 to 1,200 tornadoes every single year. In Canada, we get 100 or so, depends on the year. Um, 75% of planet Earth's tornadoes happen in the United States just because of the geography and the weather patterns, just all those ingredients coming together in places like Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, and Nebraska to, to cause these storms to spin and produce these tornadoes. You got the moisture and the, the dry line, all these meteorological ingredients come together perfectly. So we have to study the weather, spend a lot of time learning how to do this, of course, and uh, to be in the right place at the wrong time, I guess, or right place at the right time from my perspective. Now I've got a video here. I don't know if it'll, play, it probably won't play in this mode. Let me see if I can get the video to play here. Cause we did try this. Is that playing? Alex, are you able to see this? I got a crazy idea. We can hear it. We just can't see it. You can hear yeah. it, but you can't see it? Yeah. Let's do it. Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate. So what I was going to show you was a, a uh, video of a tornado in South Dakota. And at the time, I was working as a tornado chasing tour guide. And uh, we would take people to go and see tornadoes in a similar way that a mountain guide would take someone to go and climb a mountain. Um, and this particular tornado crossed right in front of us. And there was a car that was oncoming and just missed getting hit by the tornado. And uh, in terms of safety, a car is actually not a very good place to be in if you're uh, anywhere near a tornado because the tornado can take that car, and toss it, crumple it, and uh, you know, with you inside it. So in terms of safety, the best place to be if there's a tornado warning issued for where you live in the basement, and if you don't have a basement, then an interior room like a closet or a bathroom and try and cover yourself up as best as best you can. 
Uh, from tornadoes, we'll go straight to volcanoes. These geologic forces are just so very fascinating. They are as creative as they are destructive. Canada does have volcanoes, believe it or not. We've got a few out in British Columbia. Mount Garibaldi, for example, is a volcano, not currently erupting, but uh, who knows, at some point in the future, we could see an actual eruption in Canada. We have them to the south, of course, in places like Washington, Mount St. Helens. We just had the anniversary of the Mount St. Helens um, a volcanic eruption. And then up in Alaska, of course, the Aleutian Islands of Alaska are, are very actively uh, volcanic. So we're in that sort of area in between in the Pacific Ring of Fire. So we do get them, uh, but not in recent history. But they do make for some good hot springs out there. So that's good. This is a nice, nice benefit of having some mild volcanic activity in Canada. We get the benefit of the hot springs. Uh, the, the picture that you're seeing here is Krakatoa volcano. And back in 1883, it had a tremendous eruption. As a matter of fact, the explosion of that of that uh, day, back in 1883, was the loudest sound ever recorded or ever heard. There were people in Australia, 2,000 kilometers away. This volcano is in Indonesia, between Java and, and um, Sumatra. And that volcano had such force, it created a tsunami that unfortunately killed 36,000 people. And the noise was heard literally 2,000 kilometers away. So I can't even wrap my head around that. It's so unbelievable. But to be able to go there and set foot on this little island as it's slowly rebuilding itself with these smaller eruptions was really fascinating to see. And sometimes we'd get lightning bolts that would happen in that plume of volcanic ash. As it goes up, the ash particles rub together just as if you're rubbing your feet on a carpet and then touching a doorknob. That static buildup causes these lightning bolts to form in the volcanic eruption. And I've only witnessed that once before, and it was just spectacular. As someone who loves volcanoes and storms, to combine the two together, come on, it's amazing. But other volcanoes are not so much the gray, ashy, explosive type. Um, many of them are of the, the style that are more fluid. So you've got that liquid rock. And in some cases, you actually have boiling lakes of, of lava. And this particular one is Marum Volcano on Ambram Island in Vanuatu. You've probably never heard of Vanuatu. It's a small island nation between Fiji and Australia. I've been there about six times now. I've done lots of expeditions here, uh, assisted with an IMAX movie here, done all kinds of television here, and uh, done some pretty cool science here as well. And this lake of lava in Vanuatu is at the bottom of a 400 meter deep crater. So to get here, we have to fly to Vanuatu, which is difficult in and of itself, then hire a helicopter, fly to the island, get to the summit either by hiking or by helicopter, depending what the weather is like, set up a base camp at the summit. Sometimes we're there for weeks at a time. I think my record is four or five weeks at the summit. And then we have to set up our ropes to go down to the bottom. And that can take days to rig the ropes. The depth of the crater is deeper than the height of, of um, the Empire State Building. So it's absolutely massive, just this huge crater. And this lake of boiling lava at the bottom is just a sight to behold. And I wish I could play this video because there's a video here and it's really spectacular. And I can't play it for some weird reason. I don't know why. Maybe, George, at the end, we can direct people to some place that they can watch these videos if we can't get them playing. That is easy to do. That is no problem. These, uh, <laughs> all the videos I'm, uh, that I'm supposed to be showing you here are all on my YouTube channel. I'll show you later where to get a hold of them. And uh, we'll go with what we can do here. So it's all good. So interestingly, volcanic activity can create things that are other worldly that are not volcanoes as well. For example, the Nica Crystal Cave in Mexico. This is a spot that is probably the most, in my opinion, the most beautiful place on planet Earth. It looks like Superman's Fortress of Solitude. It looks like these giant ice crystals, but it's not cold at all. As a matter of fact, it's, it's deadly hot. The air temperature is over 50 degrees Celsius with a humidity of almost 100%. 
So you've got the heat of the Sahara Desert with the humidity of the Amazon jungle combined together. And as soon as you enter this cave, it's 900 feet underground. As soon as you go there, you start to die. So in order to protect ourselves, we had to wear these special orange suits that are filled with ice packets to help keep our body core temperature down. The crystals themselves, some of them are 10 meters long and weigh 55 tons. They're thick as tree trunks, just absolutely spectacular, mind blowing. And it took me almost two years to get permission to go to this particular spot. I mean, we filmed an Angry Planet episode here uh, with uh, Peter Rowe, who was my cameraman producer. He's the guy in the foreground there. And uh, just unbelievably spectacular. The crystals themselves are made out of gypsum. It's a uh, crystallized gypsum is known as uh, selenite. So it's the same material that makes up the drywall in your house, but it sat in perfect conditions. So there was this void deep underground filled with mineral rich water with lots of, of uh, gypsum in it. And there was a, a volcanic uh, chamber of magma down there that heated up the groundwater, which allowed the perfect conditions for these crystals to form. And the only reason we know that this place exists was because it was accidentally discovered by silver miners who broke into this chamber and discovered this crown jewel in mother nature's, uh, you know, the jewel in mother nature's crown, if you will. And uh, it is just truly amazing, amazing, amazing. We had to wear special chilled air respirators. So the backpack that we're wearing has canisters of ice and a little fan that blows air over that ice. And then that cool air goes through the, uh, the, the hose to a fighter pilot style mask so that we could breathe chilled air the entire time that you're down there. If you're not wearing this, what happens is, you know how if you've got a cold drink outside on a nice hot humid day, you have condensation that forms on the outside of the glass, right? We've all experienced this. Well, the coolest thing in this cave is you, right? The cave is much hotter than your body temperature and it's very humid. So all of that humidity can condense on the inside of your lungs. So the cave can drown you if you spend too much time in there without special protective equipment. We spent 15 or 20 minutes in there without the special gear just to experience the real heat. With the gear, we could only go in for about 40 minutes at a time. And then we'd have to leave, go to the cool area, which was a nice chill 45 Celsius and uh, drink a gallon of Mexican tap water and then go back into the cave. And we only had one day in this particular place. That was all the permission that we had. So. It was just truly, truly spectacular. And I, what I wanna share with you guys next is a little sort of a philosophy. People ask me why I do this and sort of what drives me. Well, it's to experience these places and then share them with as many people as possible. But also underneath all that, there's this idea that if you're the best at something, someone will always eventually come along and be better than you. But to be the first to do something, no one can ever take that away from you. And so that's why I really adore accomplishing world's firsts. And uh, that's sort of been one of, one of the trademark things that I like to try and do is to do things that have never, ever been done before. And I'm going to give you one more example of an expedition before we start taking some Q&A. And that was one that I did for National Geographic a number of years ago. This is probably the expedition that I'm best known for of all of, all of them. And it was in the country of Turkmenistan. And it's a former Soviet Republic, just north of Iran. And they have a lot of natural gas there. That's one of the main exports. And at one point they were drilling for natural gas and the entire drilling rig collapsed into a sinkhole that formed, it was about hundred feet deep, 250 feet across, 230. And they lit it on fire. So all this natural gas, this methane gas that was coming out of the crater, they lit it on fire thinking it would burn off in a couple of days. Well, that was 1971 and it's still burning to this day. So I had to go to this place. The locals call it the doorway to hell, Darvaza. It's, that's the, the translation. And so 
I uh, led a National Geographic science expedition to go here and examine the bottom of the crater looking for bacteria because this hot methane rich environment that was created by this industrial accident basically is similar to the environment that some NASA scientists have discovered on planets outside of our solar system. So if we could find anything alive, even if it's a tiny microbe living in this crater, it could give us clues as to where we should look for life on other planets moving forward in our explorations outside of our solar system. So I pitched this idea to National Geographic. They said yes, and then I had to figure out how to do it. <laughs> because this was something that no human had ever done before. I had all my volcano experience, which was uh, invaluable for, uh, for this particular expedition. And it took a year and a half to plan it all. I had a team of rope riggers. I had a microbiologist with me to study the samples. I had a television crew from National Geographic. And we had the perfect campsite right beside this pit of fire at night. It lit up the entire sky. There were birds that would swoop down into the crater just below the surface to catch the moths that were attracted by the light at night. It was just amazing. The only thing I forgot to bring was a long stick and some marshmallows. And then the plan was to stretch fire resistant ropes across the entire span of the crater. And then I would go out to the middle on pulleys with a special Kevlar harness that wouldn't melt, my protective heat suit, self-contained air with a, a oxygen tank, and then I would rappel down, set foot at the bottom, and gather some samples. And so that's what we did. We spent a week analyzing the crater, trying to figure out where the coolest parts were, where the safest areas were. And then I was able to go out on these fire-resistant ropes and then go out to the middle and then drop down. I'm going to show you a, a, a wide shot here. So there we can see there's thousands of little fires. There's one or two big fires right in the middle. And if you look just to the right of the big fire, you'll be able to see me. I'm gonna zoom in here. There we go. So yeah, it sounded like a jet engine. And so I had an earpiece in and the microbiologist, Dr. Uh, Stefan Green, he would give me instructions as to where he wanted me to dig for samples. But one of the problems was as I would dig, I would open up new vents of gas and fire would start coming out of the hole that I was digging. So the whole experience was uh, very surreal. When you're at the bottom, standing in a place where you know no human has ever been, looking around, seeing the glow of the fire, feeling the heat, knowing that you only have 17 minutes worth of air to get the job done, uh, it was just, the closest thing that I can imagine it being like to setting foot on another planet. And we found all kinds of bacteria living down there. So there is life. So these, these extremophile bacteria, the kind that are thriving in this hot environment, very unusual bacteria. So that's a, a really good scientific discovery right there. And hopefully maybe who knows how many decades down the road, this information will be useful in terms of finding life on another planet somewhere. I can only hope that my data that I've gathered might be able to help some scientists in the future to discover something on another planet. That would be so amazing. What a great legacy that would be. So uh, it'll never happen in my lifetime, but just knowing, just, just doing it and contributing is uh, just very rewarding. So science isn't all about being in, in a lab, wearing a lab coat and safety glasses. There's a lot of really cool field work that can be done out there. And let me tell you, the best feeling in the world is coming up out of that crater and being lifted out, hoisted out by your colleagues and setting foot on solid land uh, and getting away from that fire. So that was truly spectacular. And uh, I was awarded a Guinness Book uh, World Record for doing this particular expedition. They recognized its uniqueness uh, in that. So if you look at the most recent edition of the Guinness book you'll see uh, you'll you'll see me in there I think this actual picture if I'm not mistaken or one very similar uh, to it and of course while I was there I had to uh, have my RCGS Royal Canadian Geographical Society flag uh, I have the great honor of them bestowing upon me one of their flags that I bring with me on all of my expeditions and travels around the world 
And I did bring that flag down inside the crater with me. I actually, I soaked it in water so that it wouldn't get scorched. <laughs> and then I had it on my, hanging on my belt inside a chicken wire sort of contraption that I made out in the middle of the desert. And the flag totally survived. And it's been on many adventures since. So what I would love to do right now is uh, turn this over for a bit of uh, Q and A. Um, every picture I showed you, I could do an entire presentation on every single one. There's just so much to talk about, but I want to make sure that I give you the opportunity to uh, to be able to ask some questions. And what you saw just now was maybe two percent of all of the. Uh, the adventures, expeditions, and explorations that I've been so fortunate to be able to uh, conduct over the years. Well, thanks, George. I know that my jaw has been on the keyboard <laughs> between your story about pushing your own intestines back between your abs uh, and the cave that can drown you. Uh, <laughs> this was, if this is just the tip of your adventures, I can't wait to read your memoirs someday. <laughs> Um, and we do have some great questions from the audience, so we'll we'll get straight to that. Uh, first up, Adele Chen wants to know, how did you go from engineer to explorer? Yeah, so that's that's a common question that I get, and it was a slow transition. So I was working full time, working lots of overtime, very busy. This is in the mid '90s as an engineer. I was working mainly in a studio that did sound for film and television. So that actually allowed me to learn how television worked and the process and the, the editing process and all of this. So I, it gave me the vocabulary that really helped me when I started working in front of the camera. But at the time I didn't realize that, I was just doing my job. And then I would take my two weeks vacation and I would go chase storms. And then I would save up my overtime and I would go chase more storms because you can always make more money, you can never make more time. So that was the thing. I always tried to maximize the time off that I had. And then I would negotiate a month off unpaid. So I was actually working uh, 11 months of the year, minus my vacation time, minus that one month off, minus whatever overtime I would say. And I still managed to keep a full-time job. I don't know how I didn't get fired. <laughs> but it just kept snowballing until the point where I... I uh, started making the Angry Planet TV series, which we started in 2006. So from 1997, 98 to 2006, it was a slow ramping up process. And then from about 2006 until now, it's been a lifestyle more than, than a job or a career. What an enviable lifestyle <laughs> for many of us watching anyway. Um, so Michelle Chapu wants to know, can you put into words the feeling of standing in close proximity to a tornado? Mm, yes, yes, I can. It's a mixture of fear, because if you're not afraid, you're not paying attention. It's a tornado after all. But more that, more than that, the sense of awe. Awe is an emotion that we don't get to experience that often. I'm very fortunate in that I get to experience that a lot. You, you experience awe when you see something that's that's bigger than you, right? Maybe it's a beautiful sunset. Maybe it's the birth of your child. Maybe it's standing near a tornado. But that sense of seeing something that is fleeting and so big and important is really um, emotionally powerful. And so for me, that is one of the driving forces, right? And it's that awe that... It's the awe that feeds my curiosity, that pushes back the fear, that allows me to go and experience more awe. So it's, it becomes this endless cycle. It's like a loop. It's like an addiction. <laughs> for lack that's of a better recipe story. for making an explorer right there. Uh, <laughs> attack of awe, two parts curiosity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, to mix two parts curiosity with one part uh, a dash of insanity and go. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Uh, Aaron Kiley, who Aaron Kiley. Is our editor in chief, is watching tonight. He wants to know what do you think is Canada's most unique geological feature along the same lines of the places that you've visited around the world? Wow, Aaron! Of course, he would ask that question. Aaron is a good friend of mine. He's uh, he's just he knows more, way more about Canada than I do. Uh, <laughs> but let me see here. Wow, um, I mean, there's so many choices. The Great Lakes are really interesting to me. 
we have a lot of really unique weather because of the Great Lakes. We get uh, lake effect snow, we get lake breeze, uh, thunderstorms and tornadoes. We get water spouts. We get all kinds of really cool weather phenomenon that exist here because of the Great Lakes. And that's, uh, that's really good for me because I live in Toronto. <laughs> um, of course, the Rocky Mountains are amazing. It's just this geological force and the mountains and the glaciers out there. I've spent a lot of time out there documenting avalanches, putting cameras in the path of avalanches and then getting the authorities to trigger avalanches with explosives that then come crashing down and smash into my special um, reinforced camera. So that's that's kind of fun too. Very cool. Riding on icebergs in Newfoundland is a lot of fun as well. That is super dangerous actually. I've done that a few times. Um, planting uh, satellite tracking beacons at the top of icebergs. I, I did it a few years ago for Angry Planet. I did it again last year, working with uh, some good friends of mine, uh, John and Rick out in uh, out in St. John's and uh, getting up close to these beautiful icebergs that you know have spent about two years coming down from Greenland and they're in the process of dying. This is, Newfoundland is where icebergs go to die. So <laughs> to see them in their last days and to be able to climb on them and these things move and they break and they rock and they split and they explode. And uh, the last time I was climbing on an iceberg, two hours later it had rolled. So. Yeah, that's more dangerous than chasing tornadoes. Hmm. Wow, that, I, I hope to see icebergs for myself someday. I think it's absolutely spectacular, some of the images that you see out of Newfoundland around this time of year, actually. This is a good time for icebergs. Yeah, nature's uh, uh, abstract art. And hmm. the colors are beautiful, the blues are amazing. Awesome. So Pam Little wants to know, is there any ethical dilemma or do you ever feel any remorse in going somewhere new and telling the world about it, knowing that maybe it'll be opened up to tourists and changed forever? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And as a matter of fact, I have a really good example of that. And it's the example that you just saw, the fire pit in Turkmenistan. So when I did my National Geographic expedition there, it was 2013. And very few people had heard about this place. And because of all the media attention that I got and this place got, it spread like, well, like wildfire all over the internet. And so it now is the number one tourist attraction in Turkmenistan. When I was there, there was nothing. You saw in the pictures, it was just vast open desert. Now there's a picnic area, there's a proper toilet. There's actually a fence around the fire pit now. I was there last summer. I had the great opportunity to uh, to be a special guest on an on an Exodus uh, travels uh, trip to go uh, through the stands, and I got to go back and revisit this old friend, uh, this this crater. So seeing how much it's changed in 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 those few years was it was exciting because the crater itself hasn't changed, and more people are experiencing this amazing place. But I was sad at the same time that the magic has been dulled a bit because now there's a fence and it's just not quite the same. Hmm. So how do you, I guess, how do you balance that? You know, your desire to be the first to see these places and tell the world about them, obviously, because the stories are amazing, the images are amazing and, and people deserve to know. Um, I guess, how do you reconcile that? Yeah, well, that's hard because the same thing happens to, to any place, for example, um, like like Halong Bay in Vietnam, there was a time when there were no tourists there, right? And then it became this tourist hotspot where there's thousands and thousands of tourists going there every week, right? So people go, they flock to these places because they are amazing, right? And yeah, I, I mean, I can't help but feel a little twinge of guilt for maybe experience overexposing some of these places, but at the same time, I'm comforted by the thought that I get to share these places with the next generation of potential explorers and scientists and get them inspired to go and develop their own careers doing something unique and amazing and maybe doing things that frighten them a little bit, right? And that's where all the juice in life is. So uh, it's always, always gonna be a trade-off. Tornado chasing, for example. I never want to see a tornado hit a town. 
But for me, there's a moral dilemma there because sometimes they do. My being there will never change whether the tornado hits or not. But if I'm there to document it, at least people will be able to see the footage, know how bad these things can get, and then maybe, just maybe, they'll heed the warnings and go to the basement the next time there's a tornado warning for their place. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, like with uh, the, the Northern Tornadoes Project at Western University, they'll use that to sort of uh, revisit our building codes and look Absolutely. at- Absolutely. Uh, the, the director, uh, David, Dr. David Sills, is a good friend of mine who, who runs that, that, that program, right? So they're doing some really amazing work. What they're trying to do is they are trying to document every single tornado that happens in Canada, whether there are people there to see it or not. So they're using aerial surveys, satellite imagery, um, Twitter videos, you name it. They're trying to document and fully understand what's going on in Canada. The radar, the weather radars that we have don't reach the northern parts. So there are storms up there and there's tornadoes that are only affecting the chipmunks and the moose and nobody <laughs> knows about them until now. So we're learning some new stuff. And it's just, uh, I love what they're doing. Cool. All right. So next question comes to us from Shelna Walker. She's wondering if you're thinking about going cousin. for, oh, is this someone you know? <laughs> she wants to know if you're going to explore the deep ocean. I would love to. Absolutely, I would love to. I don't know if I'm going to. It sort of depends. Uh, ex deep ocean exploration is very expensive. And getting place on these submarines, these deep ocean submarines, there's only a handful of them on planet Earth. Uh, so getting a seat on them is very difficult. So I tried for quite some time uh, to get a seat on some of these submarines. The, the, the cool thing right now though, is that there's an explorer by the name of Victor Vescovo from, te uh, from Texas. And he's now got the world's only submarine that is capable of doing multiple descents to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. And I know several people who are friends of mine who have been aboard that submarine and have gone to the bottom of that Challenger D. So where there's a will, there's a way. And I would absolutely love to get a seat on that sub. Victor, if you're listening, I, I had the great pleasure of, of meeting Victor and hanging out with him for a little while in Lisbon uh, during a conference about a year and a half ago. And he's a, he's a really nice guy. And uh, I'm sure he would love to let me go down in his submarine, wouldn't you, Victor? <laughs> Failing that, you just have to become besties with James Cameron, apparently. Well, James, here's the problem. James Cameron's submarine was destroyed. It was being transported on a truck that was in an accident and it caught fire and the submarine was destroyed. So that sub, that one man submersible that James Cameron designed and built is no more. So there's only one machine now that's capable of going to those depths. And it's Victor's. <laughs> and it's Victor's and it's a two man submarine. It's two people. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll we'll do our part to make it happen. The RCPS <laughs> goes to the Challenger Deep. <laughs> I'd probably have to fight Jill Heinerth off, though, of course. <laughs> yes. For those of you who don't know Jill, she's one of the other explorers and residents, and she's a diver. So she would probably hit me over the head with her diving regulator to cut in front of line uh, ahead of me to get to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Oh, that's great. <laughs> it's a good visual. <laughs> <laughs> she can do it, too. She's tough. I know. <laughs> All right, uh, Stacy Selena wants to know, what's something no one has done yet that could be your next big first? Oh, yeah, okay. So about a year ago, satellite imagery detected a hot spot at the summit of Mount Michael in Antarctica. And it's on a small island off the coast of Antarctica. And that, that thermal anomaly that was detected is a lake of lava. Lava lakes are very rare. Um, I've been to about a half a dozen of them all over planet Earth in places like Congo, Vanuatu, Ethiopia, Hawaii. And there's two of them in Antarctica. This one that was just recently discovered, no human being has ever laid eyes on it. No one has been to the summit of this volcano. No one has ever seen the activity of this volcano other than from satellite imagery. To get there would be very difficult and very expensive. So I'm looking for patrons who are uh, have, who have deep pockets that are interested in a really epic expedition to go inside one of the world's most exotic, remote, coldest, highest, most extreme places. Call me. I'm always looking for funding. 
<laughs> but yeah, that would be amazing. I know, bottom of the screen there. <laughs> Number one on my bucket list is, is going to that volcano. Wow, that sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I love this next question from Wendy Duffy. I feel like the answer might be Wendy Duffy, but she wants to know who is your biggest supporter or fan? Oh, well, geez, I don't, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, I've never had anyone in my family ever say, no, you can't do that. No one. And I'm very grateful for that. So I have to give, you know, a huge shout out to, to my entire family, every single one of you guys for, for, allowing me to do the crazy stuff that I do without holding me back. Mm. And so, you know, your mom is always going to be your biggest fan. Come on. <laughs> That's gotta be how that works. Right. Definitely. Definitely. It's, funny. It's, it's, it's quite funny because I used to not tell my mother what I was doing until I was done the expedition, but then she started following me on Twitter and now it's, hard for me to hide anything from her anymore. So I've given up trying. That well, you should not worry too much. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, okay. You don't, you know, share the anecdotes about, you know, your intestines popping out on Twitter. <laughs> That's the first time I've heard that story. And I, well, I edited your, your well, story about your North Korea trip, and I don't remember that being in the draft, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> there's, been, there's all kinds of stories like that. Let me share one real quick one for you about Siberia. I was in Siberia, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation. And at one point I was in this place in the city of Yakutsk and we were underground and they had this facility where there was these there were these tunnels that are in the permafrost it's it's below freezing all year round and they had the preserved head of a woolly mammoth tusks hair the works been frozen in ice for 10,000 years and as climate change causes the permafrost to melt we're discovering these prehistoric animals that are being you know they're thawing out <laughs> And so I was standing next to this 10,000 year old woolly mammoth and I was doing a bit to camera, talking to my cameraman. And as soon as we were done, our Russian guide, our minder, who was keeping an eye on us, walked away and uh, I told them to keep rolling. And I took a piece of the woolly mammoth flesh and broke it off and tried it just to have a taste of 10,000 year old woolly mammoth flesh. Two days later, along the, what's called the Road of Bones, which is the old road that was built by the Stalin era gulag prisoners, I started getting really sick. Spiked a fever, was feeling like crap, and I'm thinking, oh no, did I just wake up some 10,000 year old cryogenically preserved virus <laughs> that is going to cause a global pandemic that is going to destroy life on earth as we know it. <laughs> Luckily that didn't happen. <laughs> But of course, COVID makes me think of that particular story and how I could have caused this zombie apocalypse. Thankfully, I didn't. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> but I couldn't resist. It was right there. I couldn't not try it, right? Right. Um, yeah, I you, guess. You, you want to get to you. <laughs> <laughs> Anything for a story. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, the great thing about the things that I do. When things go well, you get a, you, you know, th when things go well, things go well. When things go poorly, you still get great stories. So from a storytelling and television point of view, even when things went absolutely poorly and we failed at everything, it's still made for compelling television. So that was one of the reasons why we were able to make so many episodes. Cool. So we do have a few more questions if you're still- Bring it. Take a few more, okay. I'm in uh, lockdown, I've got no place to go. <laughs> That's true. All my, all my expeditions are canceled. <laughs> We'll just keep on asking questions then. <laughs> keep them occupied that way. Uh, so David Bond wants to know, and I'm sorry if I said that last name wrong, um, what's been your favorite first? Oh, my favorite first by far, uh, setting foot at the bottom of that fire pit in Turkmenistan. Because it was so difficult. Um, logistically, it was difficult. Physically, it was difficult. We were spied on by the government the entire time that we were there. Um, the scientific discovery that we made was significant. Uh, we made a great TV show out of it. Uh, a little side story, the TV show that we made, the, the executives in Washington DC at National Geographic headquarters decided that they were gonna call this TV show, Die Trying. 
excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> like they had planned a certain outcome in advance there. <laughs> exactly. They weren't the ones who were going to be trying. So I was a little <laughs> offended by that, but I couldn't get them to change their mind. But but certainly that particular expedition, because it took months and months of planning. And as a matter of fact, we didn't get permission from the Turkmenistan government to enter the country. It's very much like North Korea. It's very closed off. And um, we didn't get permission until two weeks after I had drawn a line in the sand saying that this was our cutoff. After this particular date, it was going to be impossible to do. We got permission two weeks after I said it was going to be impossible. So we had to, we had to pull every rabbit out of every hat, but we managed to do it. Hmm. Wow. And it made it really rewarding because of that. So that's another reason why it became my favorite. So oh my far. God. So far. So far. <laughs> yeah. Until you find the lava lake in Antarctica. <laughs> I like the way you think. All right. Uh, Chris Cridler wants to know, what do you pack for a picnic at the pit of hell? <laughs> <laughs> so so <laughs> Chris Cridler, she is a storm chasing friend of mine from Florida. We have chased many, many, many storms together over the years through Tornado Alley. And uh, uh, she's great. Go to skydiary.com. Check her stuff out. She's amazing. So we had lots of great local Turkmenistan food in um, when we were camped out at the fire pit. The funny thing is, is that to cook our food, we had to bring in firewood by truck to, to make a fire to cook the food <laughs> because you couldn't really cook it over top of the actual fire pit. All right, it seems so ironic that we had to truck in our own wood to make a fire while we're at this biggest fire pit in the world. So that was kind of bizarre. Uh, it's very difficult to be a vegetarian in Central Asia. Uh, I'm I'm not, but uh, we had some team members who were, and they struggled. Uh, we ate uh, a lot of lamb and goat, uh, rabbit, and fermented horse milk. Hmm. And if you've ever had fermented mare's milk before, it is pungent. Yeah, it's a it's a flavor that um, stings the nostrils. I'll just leave it at that. I can't even imagine. Can you, I don't know, can you describe the taste? Uh, take a jug of milk, leave it out in the sun for a couple of days, mix it with a bit of gin, and then chug it. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, uh, Dave Lewison wants to know, <laughs> what's been your most embarrassing moment during a storm chase or exploration? So it's funny, I have many of my friends tuning in tonight. Dave Lewison is another one of my very good storm chasing uh, friends and associates. We've chased many tornadoes and hurricanes together. We were Hurricane Katrina together uh, and many, many, many others. I feel like he has the inside track on this one. <laughs> well, he does. So I, you know what? I could totally throw this back at him and tell embarrassing <laughs> stories about him instead, but I'll be kind and I won't do that. Um, you know, there are times when you're out on expedition and you have stomach problems and suddenly you have violent explosive diarrhea and you have no control over when it strikes. And so there are many times when you just have to stop everything and uh, deal with that in whatever undignified manner that takes on. And I think I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I love Thanks, this. Dave. <laughs> Another great question from Javier, and I, I'm not sure if it's our Javier at uh, at I'm assume that it is. Javier, the photo editor from, uh, from <laughs> yes. Tangio. Yeah. He wants to know, can you get travel insurance to the places that you go? So yes and no. Uh, it does depend on what I'm doing um, and where I'm going. For example, when I went to North Korea, no travel insurance company would touch me. So that was another reason why I didn't want to end up in a North Korean hospital, right? Because I was just not, there's no company that's going to fly in and airlift you out of North Korea. That's just not going to happen. Um, another example was the fire pit expedition. I had to have insurance for that expedition. So the only company that would insure me was uh, Lloyd's of London. And they're that insurance company that's famous for insuring like, They'll insure anything, right? Just ask and pay. And the insurance for that one expedition alone cost me a third of my entire budget. Thankfully, I never had to use it, so that's good. But I've had to, I've had to, I shot a commercial for a fast food chain inside a volcano in Guatemala. 
And I had an interesting conversation with their insurance company when we were setting up that expedition. And they were actually quite good. They uh, they spoke the language. I was talking about rope rigging techniques. They knew exactly what I was talking about. So some of these insurance companies are really great to work with. I've actually been invited to speak num numerous times I've done this, where I've gone to insurance conferences to talk about risk management because what I do involves a tremendous amount of risk management. So I'm very proud to say I've never had a broken bone on any of my expeditions. I've never had an overnight stay in hospital while traveling. So safety is always number one. We joke around, say, we have this running joke, and I'll let you in on the little insider joke. Uh, look good, get the shot, safety third. <laughs> but in reality, safety is always number one. And I'm very proud of that. That's actually a perfect segue to our next question uh, from Bama Morthy. And again, I, I apologize if I did not say that correctly, but um, this person wants to know, how do you prepare to chase storms? Right, so most of the preparation for storm chasing comes from weather forecasting. So you have to know the time of year. So tornadoes, the, the peak of tornado season is usually the last two weeks of May, typically, plus or minus a few weeks. So that's the best time of year. The best place is the Central Plains. So now you've got a time and you've got a general location. From there, you have to use long range computer models, short range computer models, satellite imagery, radar, surface observations. So you have to learn how to make a three dimensional picture of the atmosphere in your mind. And that is the most important thing when it comes to preparing for a storm chase because you have to be in position hours before the storms ever fire up. And so, if your calculations or predictions are wrong, you're gonna miss everything. And so that is really, I cannot stress that enough. And it also helps keep you safe because the more you understand about weather, the more safe uh, a chase you will have. One thing you should never ever do is just hop in your car when you hear that there's a tornado warning for your county and then go drive into the middle of it because that's how you get yourself into trouble. Right? So learning how to weather forecast, learning how to navigate around storms, learning how the structure of storms works, where the updrafts are, where the downdrafts are, where the tornado is likely to be, where the baseball sized hail is likely to be, which will destroy your car. Um, all of these things you have to study and learn ahead of time or else you'll either see nothing or you'll get yourself into big trouble. Mm -hmm. And I've smashed a lot of windshields over the years. It does happen. Well, thank you for giving us that PSA. Storm chasing, don't try it at home. Please don't try it at home. <laughs> like George and watch when his- I off, sorry, When I started off, I learned from people who were more experienced from, than me, and I traveled with them, and I learned firsthand from them. So that's the best way I think. Uh, here's a question from a name that I recognize. Uh, Dana Russo wants to know, what was the most terrifying moment from one of your expeditions? So I'm gonna share a moment. Dana Rousseau is a meteorologist. She works at the Weather Network. I have chased with Dana as well. Every one of my friends are coming out of the woodwork tonight. I love it. Thank you guys, I appreciate this. So I'm gonna share a moment that I actually shared with Dana. Uh, back in 2013, May 31st, was uh, El Reno, Oklahoma, the largest tornado ever documented. Guinness World Record size. It was, it was a mile wide and then expanded to 2.6 miles wide, that's 4.3 kilometers. And it did that, it accelerated and turned right and went from a mile wide to 2.6 miles wide, all in less than one minute. I was on Interstate 40 going east, the tornado was ahead of me and it was just this ugly shape in the distance. I could see one edge of it and then I could see the other edge of it. And I knew that Dana and some of my other friends uh, including some of the other people who who, who sent uh, messages in earlier, uh, Chris and Dave, were nearby. I knew where they were because I could hear them on the radio. We have radio communications amongst friends. And so I was able to radio ahead to them to say, hey guys, there's a big tornado wrapped in rain here. You probably can't see it from your vantage point, but I can see it very clearly. And they had a hard time seeing what was going on from their angle, and I knew it was a bad angle for them. And uh, that was one of the contributing factors that helped them decide to head south and get out of the path of this thing, which ended up going on to kill three other storm chasers, colleagues of ours, who were very well respected. So it was the first instance of a storm chaser ever being killed by a tornado that they were chasing. 
And luckily, it wasn't Dana or any of my other friends. So that was a very sobering moment, very terrifying moment for me. And mm -hmm. it became even more terrifying after the fact because we didn't know the full extent of what had happened until the following day. So it was, uh, that was a difficult day for, for the entire weather community. Mm. We were right at ground zero for it, all of wow. us. Wow. All right, well, we've just got one more question. Um, thank you everyone watching for these great questions. Some of these have been really amazing. Um, Glenn Steplock wants to know, is there any place you wouldn't go? Is there any place, I, I'm not a big fan of places that are in active war zones. So I try to avoid those places, even though I've been to numerous places where I've had to have armed guards with machine guns, places like uh, remote Ethiopia near the border with Eritrea, places like the Congo, I had to travel with guys with AK-47s. Um, but yeah, war zones, not really my thing. Uh, you can negotiate with people, <laughs> but it's hard to negotiate with, with, uh, with desperate people who uh, who are having a very hard time, right? For me, I can look at a storm or a volcano and I can get a sense of what it's going to do. Mother Nature always throws curveballs, but I'm comfortable in those situations. If you were to put me in a war zone, I would be very much out of my element. Um, I did get a sense of some of that when I was in North Korea because it's so militarized, of course, and we have to be very careful of what we say and do when I was there. Um, but that was enough of a taste of that. So, yeah, I mean, I'd love to go to a lot of these places that are seeing conflict. I, I would love to go to Iran and Iraq. There's beautiful landscapes there. There's a cave in Iran that has got these beautiful stalactites made of salt. They're beautiful. And I want to show the world this great, this, this amazing, beautiful place. But it's really not easy to get there. There's all kinds of challenges. And and so the Wakan Corridor in Afghanistan is an amazing place that I would love to go to and showcase. So times change, places come, places go, things get better, things get worse. So I'm really looking forward to the tides changing and a lot of these places becoming more accessible in the future. Fingers crossed, we'll see. But wherever I've gone, I've always found one thing. The people are always great for the most part. Um, it's governments that are usually the, give me the trouble um, but people everywhere, they just want the same things. They want their family to be happy, healthy. They want food on the table. They want some security. And they just they just want to be happy, right? So when it all comes down to it, when you strip down all the differences, all the cultures, we're all much more alike than we are different. Great. Well, thank you so much, George. This has been such an entertaining hour, um, a great presentation, a great Q&A. Again, thank you everyone for your awesome questions. Um, we'll wrap up now. And um, if you liked what you saw tonight and heard tonight, please do consider making a donation to the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. We are a nonprofit. Um, your support will help us to put on more of these great virtual events and live events when we're able to do that again too. Um, we'll hopefully be able to have George back at our headquarters in Ottawa sometime soon. Um, so there's a couple of ways that you can make a contribution. If you are watching us on YouTube, you can donate right in the live chat. And if you're watching us on Facebook, you can actually send an e-transfer to donate at rcgs.org. And I believe Angelica has put up the email address there at the bottom of the screen. Um, so we really, really would appreciate your support. And of course, don't forget, if you would like to take advantage of our subscription deal, use promo code STORM30. And I think we're going to be keeping that going for a couple of weeks. So you can take advantage of that at any time. Uh, so once again, thank you so much, George. Uh, really, really great. And have a great night, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you so much. And if you want to check out any of the, the videos that I wasn't able to play for you tonight and see a lot more, uh, all the links for my social media and everything are all on stormchaser.ca. You can find everything there and just a lot more than you saw tonight. So thank you so much, everyone who tuned in tonight. Really appreciate it.